Great. Well, uh, welcome participants, welcome uh, panelists and colleagues. Um, today, this is the last in our series of four webinars for Exoplanet Explorers, uh, those people who are using our um, laboratory for the study of exoplanets and our DIY planet search interfaces to the Micro Observatory telescopes. And today, we're actually going to take a tour of some resources, primarily from NASA, um, that can help both if you're a classroom educator uh, and also a, a lot of great resources just for your own personal learning um, and if you're an informal educator. So we'll be looking at all those things. And uh, again, uh, we have... Um, uh, panelists with different backgrounds to comment on their experience with either these resources or um, uh, questions you might have. And I will, again, let them say hello so that you can see them on screen for a moment. And um, Jim, when I introduce you, don't forget to unmute yourself. First of all, we have Jim Kernahan, who is a, a high school teacher. Jim? Hi. Uh, from Milton Academy, I teach uh, high school freshmen and seniors. I've been using microobservatory and exoplanets for years and years. Great. Thanks, Jim. And also, um, we have um, Martin Fowler, who, uh, uh, Martin, I'll let you say more about yourself so that they could see you for a little bit. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Yes. You can. Um, hi everyone, uh, Martin Fowler here. I'm uh, from Winchester in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer who's been using um, exo or the micro observatory for six or seven years. Uh, I'm most recently looking at the exoplanets and I've been working with Mary um, and Frank uh, trying to take forward the, the um, how the, the observations can be taken forward. And I'm sure Mary's going to say some more about that later. Great. And uh, of course we have Erica in my uh, office, so unable to take control of the video, but there she is. And, you, and uh, uh, also just joining us um, is a doctoral candidate here at the uh, Center for Astrophysics, Shani Nava. Yes. Hello. Sorry for my lateness. And the link went to my spam folder for some reason, but very happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Great. And uh, Shani uh, is available for science Q&A as we go along as well. So, great. So, um, if you have any questions, Erica will, and all our panelists will be monitoring that chat box. I may, I may not be, so I'm going to ask them to interrupt me if there's something that needs attention right away. So the first resource I actually want to talk about is um, a downloadable application. It's a downloadable app uh, from the uh, JPL from the Exoplanet Exploration Program, and it's called Eyes on Exoplanets. And uh, I actually am going to, um, so this, these slides will, will post on the online uh, community so that you have the links to all these resources. Um, but this is the website where you download this app. And I already have it launched, so I'm going to drag it into the window here so you can see it. I think I have it launched. Um, apparently I don't. Here it comes. There we go. Uh, when you download it, the application actually includes several different versions. There's visualizations of the Earth and Earth-observing satellites. There's eyes on the solar system, which allows you to explore all the planets in the solar system through the eyes of the spacecraft that have been there. And then eyes on exoplanets, which I'm going to start up right now. Um, and I'm going to go full screen and really test the throughput of this webinar uh, software. So um, once this starts, I'll have it go full screen. And um, the application opens, I'm gonna turn its audio off by kind of orienting you in the solar system 
um, and your view now is a thousand light years from the solar system, from Earth, and we're looking back in, in the region of stars where all these exoplanets have been discovered in our galaxy. So it's a really nice visualization engine for understanding where all these planets are that um, have been discovered. And you notice at the bottom, it has an update of the planet count, 3,726, um, around 2,779 different stars. And, um, it has Earth-like planets at zero, meaning we've got many Earth-sized planets. We don't yet know if they're Earth-like. So, um, um, Mary, sorry, Jim has a question. He was wondering, is this app for PCs or tablets, phones, and also is it free? Uh, let's, um, let's find out. Doesn't really say, does it? I think you have to go and check it out yourself. <laughs> it doesn't say technical requirements, so. I believe um, it's at least available for both PCs. I think I think PCs and Mac at least, but. And it is free. And it is definitely free. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so right now, I'm going to grab, I'm using my cursor to grab, and you can see you get a 3D, it's a, it's a 3D engine, so anything you're exploring, you can use your cursor to visualize from any angle. And uh, each of these little colored stars is a, is, is a discovered exoplanet. Here's Corot 3, I'm going to click on that, and uh, it's going to, take us to Caro 3. So right now it's um, taking us to the star and you see a visualization and again I'm going to click and drag and you can see that it can show you that star and in fact if I, I can drag it so you see the transit um, uh, and you can also do um, uh, several other things. So I want to go back to the home here and uh, note that you can, uh, we talked earlier in an earlier webinar about the TRAPPIST-1 um, solar system or star system, planetary system that has seven Earth-sized planets. And so if I click on that, we're going to go to that system in this visualization engine. This visualization actually draws on the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which I'm gonna show you in a bit as well. So it's really taking its data and running this visualization engine from uh, the data about all these planets. I'm gonna use my scroll bar on my mouse now and notice I can zoom in and out. You can also use these controls over to the right. So I'm zooming out to see all seven. And again, I'm going to click and drag. And I can get this um, system to be kind of almost face on just so I can see it. Or I can put an edge on so I can see many transits of all those planets. A nice feature of this visualization engine is that you can co always compare with our solar system. So if I click on that button, you're going to see here's the orbit of Mercury and here's the whole TRAPPIST system. In fact, if I zoom out a little bit again, there's the orbit of Venus. And so uh, again, you can see that that star that these planets are going around uh, it is a much cooler star. Here it tells you the star type um, and the magnitude. And the mass of this star is only eight one hundredths, uh, barely a tenth of the mass of our sun. So all these planets are orbiting around a small star. You can also search for planets. So if you're using this with students 
or you've used DIY and you're wondering more about the uh, planet you discovered, um, you can search that planet. So let's see, last, a couple weeks ago, we all uh, contributed to TREZ3. So I'm gonna type in TREZ3 and hit go. And it, I can look at the star or the planet first. Let's, let's go to the system as a whole. It's gonna take us right there. And, <clears throat> oh, it's taking us to the planet view. Okay, a hypothetical visualization. Remember this was a hot Jupiter. Again, I can click and drag and turn around. I'm see, There's the star, and you see that it has realistic shadow effects on the planet as well. I really like this 3D engine. If I zoom out, right, you start to see the actual, yeah. And, um, uh, and again, I can have the system view and see Trez orbiting. It's, it's going crazy here. Oh, I must have. Somehow it thinks I'm inside the star. This is a problem. <laughs> Let me zoom out. What is happening? Okay, my, my mouse must be doing something very strange. Compare with our solar system. And again, you'll remember that we discovered that TRES-3 was... Uh, like two million miles, I think. It was much closer than Mercury, and here's the visualization of that. So uh, this Eyes on Exoplanet is really a great tool to um, visualize and explore uh, different planets and um, uh, the ones that you've collected real data from, and the, the visualization of, of the distances and, and the um, features that they've applied to the planets uh, are based to the degree that they can be on, on the data that we have about that planet. Okay. Um, I'm going, any questions about this or does anybody want to, did you want to look at something on this? And we'll, well, I don't see anything coming. All right, we'll go to the next resource. And that. All right. Um, so, as I said, the um, uh, Eyes on Exoplanets is downloadable from the uh, NASA Exoplanet um, Exploration site, which is here at exoplanets.nasa.gov. And I'm gonna go there now while we're looking. And um, I noticed something when I, when I opened this just before the webinar began. Our Eyes on Exoplanet app that we just opened had 3726 confirmed planets. And I looked here and it's 3730. And uh, I think if, if we go through the, the news items here, there's one from a few days ago where there was a system with five planets discovered and one planet was demoted from being a planet. And so um, that news item is why uh, I think that the app hasn't updated itself yet. So it's, it, this is really live um, science. At any rate, on this exoplanet exploration site, there's a lot of great material. There's um, background material to, for your students or for yourself to learn about exoplanets. Uh, there's information about the, the science program. Um, I think I demonstrated in our first webinar, Five Ways to Find a Planet. That's on this site here. That, that um, little tool for learning about the five ways to find a planet. Um, the, uh, this New Worlds Atlas uh, is a, is a, um, a way of looking up basic features of 
any star. And so again, we can type in Trez three and here we get some basic information about it. Um, uh, and you can filter by discovery method, planet type, etc. So there's some nice um, ways to explore planets on this site. Um, I think the uh, the next thing I want, so um, yeah, so let me close that. The next thing I wanted to demonstrate was the Exoplanet Archive for Scientists. So this is where all the data, where NASA stores all its uh, exoplanet data, and, um, and in fact, all the data on all exoplanets discovered. So this is the site, the data from this site is what's driving that visualization engine. Uh, and it's also where you can look up the, um, the kind of published values for the stars that you might be exploring with microobservatory. And uh, so I'm going to go there and show you how to do that. So we'll open that in the window here. And here's where, this is where five new planets, one retraction. Five transiting planets have been added and one was removed. And that's that difference between that uh, 3,000 730 and 3,726 in our two resources here. Um, okay, so if, again, I can explore the archive if I type in TRES3 and type search. Um, so this page, is where I can find all the scientific information, published papers about TRES-3, if you want to read about it. You can find, uh, typically the earliest one is the discovery paper. And you can find the properties. I don't know if you guys remember um, uh, what percentage dip we got for TRES-3, but, um, I think it was pretty close to 3%, right? With microobservatory, and there's the uh, published depth of the transit. You may also remember we calculated, we used that to calculate the, um, we used our uh, transit depth, and we took the, um, oh, help me with this, Jim. We took the square root of, the, <laughs> of, of that depth, to get the ratio of the planet to stellar radi radius. And I think we got 0.17. Actually, Jim has a question too. Uh, yeah. That's, um, that's a great question. So Jim asks, and we've had this conversation before, I think um, Lindsay would be interested in this too, the, the question of students verifying their results with what the professionals got. I think I talked earlier about the fact that uh, student results are results and they're just as valid as the professional results as long, you know, understanding that they may have used an instrument that's less precise, uh, that has more uncertainty, but the, the the results of the scientists are also not the answer. There is no answer. There are only results. And so I think you really have to emphasize that. Um, uh, yeah, one comment I have too is just, it really presents a great opportunity to talk about error bars and the errors on these numbers too, because I mean, you know, I think there's probably a much smaller error on whatever data we're using. Um, versus these smaller telescopes. And so they might see that, you know, their number might be off, but still within the errors agrees, which is something that very often happens in real science and is a great thing for them to experience. And then if it doesn't agree to really consider, okay, what are some ways in which we might have, you know, had something go wrong here? Because that's important to think about too. And um, for those of you, if you uh, I think it was 
the second webinar um, where Martin talked about uh, some of his studies of uh, which which planet was it, Martin, where you're finding that the published period that is the default period on this archive is actually probably not the best period. Yeah, um, just gonna look it up. Hang on, I can't, I can't remember. Uh, um, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, I thought it was one of the Hungarian. Was it happy 54? Not too sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, and so, uh, uh, Lindsay, who is right, just wrote in the chat box, is there a chance that with future measurements from tests that microobservatory observations might be good enough to refine periods? The answer is absolutely. Uh, there, um, Rob Zellum, who spoke last uh, Monday, um, Tuesday, uh, is really hoping that microobservatory can observe, do lots of follow-up observing of uh, uh, short period hot Jupiters that are kind of in the wheelhouse and for for um, tests and really nail down the um, the period by doing follow up observations. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's a great resource if you happen to be on um, on the. Uh, DIY or microobservatory websites. We actually, for our target stars, if I go to DIY Planet Search, and I think I'm already logged in. Um, if you go to the uh, planets, you'll see that for every one of our target stars, we have a link. We have two links. One is to that um, New Worlds Atlas. For that star which gives you the basic info but the other link is to that NASA data page for that target star so um, so we link directly to it but uh, you can also get there just by using the search bar on the website I just showed you um, did, Martin, did you figure out the, your star that you nailed, that you just... No, I'm... I'm different just, period? Yeah, that's fine. But anyway, just, it can be done. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know, just give me a minute. And, and, and Jim, to, to your point with in terms of students, the fact that it was using, doing multiple observations with microobservatory and comparing them to the published values that Martin discovered that the value in the archive that they say is the right one, you should use this one, is not the right one. There's another published paper that's closer that has a has a closer period. So great. Okay. Um, so let me go back to my resources here. We'll go. So there's the archive. Um, then there are uh, lots of resources from NASA that go out with the press releases for various discoveries. And these are really good to um, j just for imagery, for creating your own presentations, for um, working with kids. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the one of the uh, biggest NASA exoplanet related releases of the past year was this discovery of the TRAPPIST-1 system. And there are all these great uh, illustrations done um, that uh, are on the on the Spitzer website. Uh, Spitzer was the telescope that um, kind of found the whole system of seven, and has has the data uh, to add to the original discovery of the Trappist one system. So. Uh, the next resource that I actually did want to go to directly and show you is back on that um, exoplanets.nasa.gov site. Uh, and, and in particular, it's this um, series of travel posters. They're really great. I have, I think I gave Erica some and we have some around the office. Uh, and these 3D visualizations. Again, Nobody's ever seen these planets. It's all indirect evidence. So 
uh, but everyone wants to use our imagination to imagine what they're like. And so um, here is the uh, 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 website. And if I go to explore the galaxy, you can see uh, there's a series of posters and you can get the poster as a high resolution PDF that you can print. Um, but there's also this feature of explore a surface. And these are the 3D um, um, visualizations. And in fact, uh, here, I was bringing one up. You notice there's a warning. You are viewing an artist's impression. Uh, no actual images of this planet exist. Um, these visualizations are also available. They work in Google Glasses. If you have those cardboard Google Glasses, it's really 3D as you look around. Um, but if I use my uh, cursor, I can drag around this system. And uh, they have kind of some here. You can click on some of the labels here, hypothetical water, right? So there's some. Uh, key things in this visualization to look for. Um, here's the star. And remember that Trappist system is in close. Remember it was so close that in fact, you uh, would actually see the stars that are inside of you. Um, you would see the phases of them and they would be pretty large in the sky like our moon. So uh, this is a great visualization for showing that. Um, I don't know if there's anything along the other way, a big rock. Okay. <laughs> so, um, all right, mm -hmm. choose a different, yeah. So again, uh, there's several planets that have these, uh, 3d visualized surfaces. Um, no, this one, this, here's a planet with two suns that's orbiting a double star. Um, I'm not sure if we get to see that. Oh, we do get to see that, yes. So, um, and they put double shadows on their visualization here. So it's nice to have, um, to, to really think about what are the implications of finding a particular uh, planet at a particular distance uh, around a particular brightness, brightness of star. And, and these visualizations really pan out the implications of these discoveries. Okay, I'm gonna uh, go back to my presentation here. And I think I'm gonna go back full screen. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Um, here's a, uh, resource that is, um, a, a great for kind of out of school learning, or it may pique your students interest more. It's, uh, the NASA's Astrobiology Institute, which is, um, both looking at signs of life within the solar system, exploring potential for life um, and the evidence for past life on Mars, Europa, other planets. They produced this series of graphic novels or graphic, gra they aren't novels, I guess they're nonfiction, <laughs> graphic books. Um, and this one, if I, uh, let's see, if I open it in a new window. Um, yeah, this one is all about uh, searching for exoplanets and it's a really great graphic novel uh, it, you know, it, it talks about JWST, it features cartoons of real scientists, uh, and also the, uh, kind of a lot of different scientists. So it shows uh, real people from many different backgrounds who are actually uh, studying exoplanets. Um, so uh, it's a great, it's, it's just a fun, a fun way to learn about uh, exoplanets. All right, so let's see, I'm gonna, uh, hmm. how do I get rid of that? That's it. 
don't know. I guess I should do this. There we go. And I've lost my <laughs> I've lost my presentation. Hmm. Let me see if I can find it. Huh. Interesting. There it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Next resource. Um, uh, again, I don't think I'll go there for these, but these are um, computer interactives. These are more for informal learning settings at, at that exoplanet.nasa.gov site. You can, um, uh, on one of them, you can modify the size of your world, the distance from its planet, and it visualizes a surface of the planet, and then you can print out uh, the look, um, and you, it, you can uh, control variables that will affect its habitability. So it's a nice interactive uh, about that. Um, and then Alien Safari is more an astrobiology uh, interactive. Um, a resource for those of you who um, may be uh, an amateur astronomer or you may do a star party for uh, people, um, the, the Night Sky Network, NASA's Night Sky Network and the uh, um, uh, NASA's Astrophysics Program put together these universe discovery guides uh, that have information for uh, doing programming and night sky observing that's related to different astrophysics topics. And uh, I've picked out two here that are related to uh, discovering planet families. And there's uh, activities in these guides. Again, if I, if I open them up, um, uh, you um, are all planet families like ours. If I download that, I think it will open up. There it is. And um, there's some background information, uh, places in the sky where you can look for um, either naked eye or stars that you can see with a telescope that are hosting exoplanets. Of course, all you see is a star. Um, you certainly aren't gonna see the um, planet. But this guide in particular happens to have a um, link to a um, online interactive for building your own planet system. You notice it also has a link to our micro observatory site. So um, all these resources are refer to each other. Um, the simulator here, which is in this discovery guide, I'm going to uh, open briefly. And um, show you that because it's uh, it it has a real gravity engine in it and it shows you um how how hard it is to get a, a you know to kind of set up a stable situation of um, multiple planets and so you can kind of place them in here and um start the planets going around and you can see if this is a stable if you and if you put kind of small planets nearby or big planets uh, nearby and small planets out far do they perturb each other and kick you know sometimes a planet will get kicked out because of a large jupiter sized planet perturbing its orbit so uh, this is a nice um a nice interactive to explore how solar systems, um, the dynamics, the gravitational dynamics of a solar system. Okay. Um, and let's go back to my tour. There we are. Um, here are some uh, activities. Uh, this is just. Um, We talked about transit, finding transits as one method of discovering exoplanets. We talked about um, uh, radial velocity, 
uh, as a way of uh, finding exoplanets. This is a little, just a little activity of, around the idea of creating, uh, creating a, a eclipse of the star to be able to see the the reflected light from a planet, um, or possibly the thermal light using the Spitzer telescope or something like that by blocking the bright light from the star. And uh, so it's a little activity using an LED and a little coronagraph, uh, which is the idea behind future NASA missions um, to study exoplanets. There are a bunch of resources that the Kepler mission, which has discovered so many exoplanets, um, developed uh, for both the classroom and for informal use. The, uh, the activity pictured on the screen, this uh, human orrery, uh, is a great way to um, kind of do a kinesthetic solar system where students are the uh, planets. And uh, it's it, 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 the, um, the orbits are based on the, our own solar system, but you could then extend this and uh, uh, create other uh, circles for other solar systems. So that's a, that's a great activity. And these two sites, again, I will um, post this uh, whole slideshow so that you have all these links uh, and maybe we can send them out as well. Um, but these two sites have a lot of these uh, activities. So the education site um, for Kepler has these activities. Here's that human orrery. Uh, some of the activities have disappeared. Uh, this light graph grapher software is more about making models of transits. They're, there used to be um, a piece of software that took over your webcam as a detector of light, but uh, that doesn't seem to exist anymore. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go tour. And um, and then the Kepler the Kepler page itself on the main NASA website is a great place for more information about exoplanets. Um, now, those of you who are citizen scientists, um, the, uh, there is an opportunity to build your own instrument to detect exoplanets. Uh, it's called Project Panoptes, and uh, the, um, it's a citizen science project where uh, some scientists are partnering with JPL and, and NASA's University of Learning. Uh, and they're asking amateurs who admittedly have about $5,000 to spend. <laughs> so, so if you can come up with $5,000, they um, have all the plans for building this little binocular. It takes two um, DSLR cameras and they have all the, um, all the hardware and software design uh, for you to build your own little suitcase with two DSLR cameras and, and, and then you hook it into the internet and they're using these cameras, hopefully by amateurs all over the world, to survey the sky uh, every night. So that's a really interesting uh, public outreach project. We've been collaborating with Project Panoptes to think about how um, we might get some of the images taken by these telescopes into our uh, microobservatory photometry analysis, or how uh, discoveries that Panoptes may make can be followed up by microobservatory, because these are again going to be um, primarily uh, uh, hot Jupiters um, being discovered. And did we have a question? Lindsay was asking if yeah. you have uh, these links as a NASA wavelength list. Yeah, um, I actually, I actually was going to put NASA wavelength as as one of my resources itself, and I didn't 
have time to make a list, Lindsay. So uh, I think that's a great uh, resource. I had looked up, and there are some NASA wavelength lists that Universe of Learning made slightly related to exoplanets, but it's not comprehensive. Um, so I think a list with these links would be a great thing. Uh, again, for those of you who are not familiar with NASA Wavelength, if you go to um, uh, nasawavelength.org and you can enter the search term exoplanet, and some resources come up. Those of you who may teach at the college level or even high school level, there's a here's a slide set about Kepler's discoveries. I think it's a couple few years old now. There's a, a resource guide for college instructors here with all kinds of resources. Um, these are the universe discovery guides that I just mentioned earlier. And the Kepler star wheels are on that Kepler um, website, but uh, these are uh, make it yourself planospheres that actually have the naked eye exoplanets um, printed right on the um, on the star wheel. So, um, Lindsay, I think that's a great idea. Let's let's. Uh, if, if you're if you're willing to, uh, I, I'll work with you, and then we can send that out to the group. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. Um, let's get back to our tour. Uh, finally, the um, possibly not finally, but <laughs> the the uh, universe of learning itself has uh, done a series of. Uh, what they call science briefings for a group called Museum Alliance, which is a, a NASA community of museum educators, uh, informal educators, and they do them on all kinds of astrophysics topics, but they've done several specifically on uh, exoplanets, and the nice thing about those presentations is um, they are uh, presentations by the scientists who are doing the research, and um, that uh, material. Here, here's uh, um, this uh, webinar done in March, uh, which is Women's History Month. Actually, was focusing uh, not only on exoplanets but on uh, uh, women who are exoplanet scientists. And so there were three presenters presenting their research. And the nice thing about it is that the powerpoints. Um, the audio recording uh, and resources and the NASA wavelength list um, for that topic is all located uh, on the uh, NASA Universe of Learning Science Briefing site. So um, there's other topics as well, of course, uh, all around dark matter and uh, other topics in astrophysics, but there's several several science briefings that were specifically on uh, exoplanets. And so that's a great resource for um, both student learning and for your own personal learning. All right. So I think I have uh, gone through the resources I wanted to share with you. Um, and I wanted to end by thanking all the participants. It's been great to have such active conversations going on through these webinars. I wanna thank all the panelists who um, uh, have really contributed a lot, I think. Um, and I wanted to uh, let you know that the, the this, last live webinar does not have to be the end of the conversation. In fact, we'll be posting all these resources again on that uh, uh, Exo, Exoplanet Explorers community website that uh, Erica sent you all account information for. Um, and uh, uh, that site will still continue to monitor it in terms of conversations or questions that come in. So that if you have questions as you either try to implement ExoLab or try to do your own uh, transit 
uh, transits using DIY uh, planet search. You can ask us questions and um, uh, we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. I wanted to mention that um, our, our funders for this webinar series, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and NASA's Universe of Learning. Um, and uh, we are going to be sending out, our evaluators gonna send out an evaluation survey to all the registrants, uh, probably on Monday. And um, I really encourage you to be candid in those surveys about things you might have wished for but didn't get. Uh, uh, things you think need improvement, please be candid, um, and uh, you'll get that email um, on Monday. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. So uh, I want to see if any of our presenters have things they want to add, and I can't find them in my left. Oh, to see their faces? Yeah, where did they go? Mary, could I add another one? Yes. The University of Nebraska uh, has a wonderful astronomy department and they have a wonderful series of labs and simulations online. Uh, they have a lot of clicker questions on every astronomical topic. Uh, they have a wonderful lab on exoplanets where they simulate data and you can say, I have 5,000 data points and here's what the transit would look like. Or you could say here, I have 50 data points. Here's what the data would look like. And then you can put in how sloppy the data is. Uh, and you can simulate a cloudy sky or a, a full moon is out. Uh, so even though there's a tr uh, transit, you might not be able to convince yourself because the data is kind of sloppy. Uh, so after I do a couple of hands-on activities, I have the kids play with that. And then we look at our own real data from, uh, from this website. Uh, Ah. So I think it's a great way to cycle everything around. Right, right. Very nice. Do you, so that's the um, University of Nebraska. Just Google University of Nebraska Astronomy Labs and you'll find it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, there it is right there. Oh. <laughs> <You're losing. laughs> Lindsay, quick on the draw. That is excellent. Okay. Um, any other questions or? Hi. There was, a, there was a question um, about using, or more or less the, the accuracy of, of uh, the micro-observatory for measuring transits. I just want to say that I've, as Mary's aware, uh, I've, I've studied uh, at least 30 transits of the uh, HAP P32B uh, planet. Uh, I'm in the process of, of writing it up as a, as a paper. Um, and so, um, at some point, I'll 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 post a preprint of that on on the on the site. But um, yeah, it, it's looking quite good. I'm I'm just having to do quite a bit of number crunching at present. Yes. So that so the nice thing is because we observe a small set of um, hot Jupiters, we observe them for many many epochs, and uh, Martin has been able to gather yeah, multiple, multiple epochs. It's hard for professional uh, uh, scientists to get observing time for multiple, multiple, multiple ex epochs. So uh, Martin's been able to take advantage of the fact that this is a feature of microobservatory in the way we observe um, exoplanets. And that actually reminds me, since I do have a little more time, I forgot to do the live demo of what we're, this is a future feature of DIY planet search that Martin has been helping us develop. So I'm going to go share my screen again. And um, uh, I'm going to go back to um, somehow here. I'm going to go back to um, the exoplanet archive here. So um, one of the things you remember, the ExoLab uh, has in the Data Lab module, it has that um, modeling tool. Uh, in fact, if we just go quickly here. And um, so, uh, you'll remember, let's see, we, I think we all did TRES-3 here. 
And on page five, you have this opportunity to fit your own model and see what the best fit is. Well, uh, this is kind of a, you a manual model, which you explore man with your hand and eye to see where the best fit is. But the Excel Planet Archive has a, um, a software modeling tool for transit fitting data. And so uh, Martin has been helping us figure out how to format, because once you do your photometry on your 70, 80, 100, or your class does that on your um, data set for microobservatory, you basically have a data set that includes time, relative bright and relative brightness. And once you have that, uh, there's uh, these software tools that can do a fit, uh, a, a fit to that transit. So this is the terribly overwhelming transit fitting uh, website for the NASA Exoplanet Archive. We're going to be working with them to make a much simpler interface uh, that uh, for microobservatory data. But I actually have some of Martin's data, and I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to show you that data and do a little, uh, where is it here? Let me find it. Here it is. So here is um, kind of a raw file of, this is the Julian date of Martin's observations. This is the relative brightness of the target star versus the comparison stars. And uh, this is an error um, here. And then there's some other, there's some other uh, parameters which we actually don't need. Those, those you, you, so, uh, but at any rate, that's, that's kind of what you've generated by, by mm -hmm. using Exolab uh, or DIY. And so I'm gonna upload that into um, this ExoFast transit fitting tool. Let me find it here. It's, uh, where did I put it here? Hat P, let me, sorry about my desktop. <laughs> this is where it all, it all, <laughs> you see that. All right. There it is. Um, For this, we select the Caro band, which most closely mimics microobservatory. Um, and we're going to uh, enter the planet name over here to put in priors. And it's uh, hat P32B. I think if I load priors. There we are. OK, so those went in there. And um, for some reason, it needs a number here. And I just put in one. I have no idea yeah. <laughs> what that does, but I'm going to put in one. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going to run ExoFast. Uh, upload. Did I upload that? Yeah. OK. So it's got the data. It knows there's 92 points. So there were 92 microobservatory images that ran from this Julian date to this Julian date, which is actually a period of a few hours. And so now we're gonna run the ExoFast transit fitting tools and cross my fingers, because this is all <laughs> live. Uh, so I clicked on that. Oh, calculating, please wait. That seems promising. Um, and so uh, what we're working on is uh, creating a tool so that once you do a, um, uh, a data set using microobservatory. You can use uh, this tool to do a transit fit uh, to see if um, see if it agrees with the uh, published data and see what uh, this tool. Ah, there it is. Yay. It worked. So <laughs> this particular data set, given and and of course the Exoplanet Archive is using some of the priors for this previously discovered. So it ha already has information about HAT P32. And knowing that information, it's saying that our data set suggests that 
the, um, I think here we are, suggests that the exact time of the transit was here. It's suggesting that the, um, it's 0.167 stellar radii um, in size. And so it's giving us all these parameters from your um, microobservatory data. Uh, so uh, we, we'll keep you posted on uh, using that tool. Anyway, I forgot to do that. So I'm glad we had a few minutes left at the end here. And uh, I'll um, stop my share now. Yeah. So anyway, any other comments or questions before we wrap up? Great. That's good. Well, thank you all for joining us for this series. And um, uh, we will keep the conversation going in other modes as we move into the future. So thank you all very much. Bye, Bye Mary. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>